What's up everyone, Ben with the BTC Sessions here and this is your daily session. Hodl the Bitcoin. Before we dive into the news, just a quick reminder, do check out my website, btcsessions.ca. There you can reach out to me for your own BTC session. We can talk Bitcoin, wallets, proper security, anything you like. Just scroll down to the bottom here and you will get a contact form where you can reach out to me directly. Beyond that, I do have a Teespring link. You can grab some swag, the hashtag Bitcoin Twitter shirt, something, some swag with my face on it, whatever you like. And last thing, uh, very excited for this. It's coming up next week on Tuesday and Wednesday, March 5th and 6th. The Bitcoin Rodeo presents the Blockchain and Technology Symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Lots of great people there. Safedine is going to be there talking about the Bitcoin standard. My boss, Francis Pouliot, is going to be there. We've got Rodolfo Novak from OpenDime. I'm going to be kind of hosting and in introducing a lot of the panels. So very excited to be there. Please do check us out. Please do come down if you're in the area. And Bull Bitcoin is going to be there. We're going to have a uh, booth with lots of swag. So lots of fun stuff. Come down, check it out. Tickets can be found at bitcoinrodeo.com. And I hope to see you there. But without further ado, we're going to dive into the news. And the first story here is a doozy. So I'm going to try and sum this up as best I can, but I do encourage you to go to the article yourself and read through it at least once, probably a couple times, because it took me a couple read-throughs to fully kind of grasp everything that was being said here. So let's dive in. Take a look at this picture or these pictures on the left. That would be somebody by the name of Omar Dinani. Uh, He's a convicted felon, and this was a shot of him as he was being... uh, detained back in 2005 for a number of crimes, which we will discuss here. Uh, To the right, this is Michael Patron, the co-founder of Quadriga CX. Are these the same person? Let's discuss. (laughs) So we're going to dive in. First, let's talk about Omar Danani. So he was uh, a member of something called shadowcrew.com. Now, what did they do there? Well, they trafficked stolen credit cards and identities. In fact, 1.5 million stolen credit cards and banker bank information of different clients. Uh, Omar's part in this website was to provide members with anonymous money laundering services for a fee of 10%. Uh, The U.S. Attorney's Office in New Jersey also said that he went by the alias Omar Patron. Now, he ended up spending 18 months in prison and was released in 2007 for his part in uh, this little shadow crew group. Um, And he was deported to Canada in 2009. A few months after his release and then subsequent deportation, somebody by the username Patron started popping up on message boards once again uh, saying that his services, you know what those entail, are once again available. Omar Patron went on to found a website called Mgold, and Mgold had dealings with another website called Liberty Reserve. And Liberty Reserve was a platform that enabled $18 billion worth of transactions, including credit card fraud, ID theft, child pornography, narcotics trafficking, amongst others. It was eventually shut down in 2013. Now, I wanted to highlight something of just how blatant it was that anybody could do anything on this site. Um, Here we go. Uh, So during the sting operation that was done on this site, a U.S. agent, an undercover agent, was able to create an account name called Joe Bogus. Uh, He was from completely made up city and he sent funds to another undercover agent with the memo for cocaine. (laughs) So so really, obviously, they weren't really caring what was happening on the platform there. Um, Anyways, so it was shut down in 2013. Now, with the shutdown of uh, Liberty Reserve, M-Gold was also seized. And why was it seized? Well, because it was basically carrying out all of the money laundering operations for Liberty Reserve. The contact email for mgold.com was 
Omar Patron's email address admin at patron.com. Well, when the Globe and Mail was researching everything for this article and they were reaching out to Michael Patron, well, they were contacting him via admin at patron.com, that exact same email address. Furthermore, connecting Omar Patron, Omar Danani, Michael Patron, there was a traffic ticket in 2011 for Michael Patron in BC uh, and noted in the court documents were that his alias was also Omar Patron. Uh, further to that, there was a civil suit against o- uh, Michael Patron, again for traffic violation, in 2013. And the address, the physical address, which was in Calgary, was the same physical address as the one listed for mymgold.com. And just for the cherry on top, Michael Patron used that same email address, admin at patron.com, to hire reputation.ca, which is a service that allows you to scrub previous records of your name from the internet. And he hired them specifically to scrub any links between him and Omar Patron using that email address. So there it is. I hope I summed that up nicely. But are these two one and the same? It's pretty damning evidence here. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss here because this is just a whole other level on top of everything that's happened with Quadriga CX. With uh, if, if you don't know the whole story, you need to go and look back. But essentially, Quadriga CX, once Canada's largest online Bitcoin exchange, has fallen from grace. Essentially, customer funds just uh, inaccessible anymore after the death of the founder, who apparently had sole custody of all of the private keys for that money, not to mention they had millions of dollars locked up in third-party services, so on and so forth. Um, It's a mess, and I would not be surprised if there are not further stories uh, coming up around this, but let's leave that there. Again, do check out the article. I glossed over a lot of stuff. I tried to sum it up as best I could. Let's dive into the next story. Okay. So this story from Crypto Globe, 74% of all Bitcoin nodes are located in 10 countries, data shows. So um, this little infographic here shows the top 20 countries uh, running Bitcoin nodes, numbers by country, United States up at the top with 26, 25, and Canada where I am around 402. Hopefully that's being counted in there as one of them. Um, it should be stated that not all nodes are visible in the network. So these are just visible nodes that they are talking about. Now, the I, I got to say that the title here, it almost beckons for people to be worried about this as if this was a centralization problem. But um, a node, a lot of nodes in a single country should not be a worry at all. And the reason for that is we need to take a look at what a node is and what it does. Well, essentially what a node is, like the one I'm running behind me, is an individual has downloaded a specific software, uh, a protocol. And that protocol has specific rules which govern it. So for Bitcoin, things like there's a 21 million cap, uh, a new block is mined roughly every 10 minutes. Um, uh, things like, okay, well, there's a one megabyte limit on, on block size, which has changed. It's now block weight, but besides the point. Anyways, rules like that that govern the network. And me running a node essentially means that regardless of what happens outside of this node, I will always abide by the rules that I have chosen and have opted into. Nobody can coerce me into running something different. And that's very important when it comes to something like your money. You don't want outside entities being able to tell you what rules you need to abide by. If something changes with Bitcoin and I don't agree with it, I don't have to go with it. People refer to nodes sometimes as voting, but it's really not like voting because if it were, 
if I voted and everybody else voted for something else, then I would have to go along with them. That is not the case. Imagine if you voted in the next election and regardless of what everybody else did, if you voted and you really wanted to go by that set of rules, you got to go by that set of rules. So you get your own government just by choosing it. Um, so it's really quite different from uh, from voting. So in that sense, is it a worry that you have the uh, 74% of all Bitcoin nodes in only 10 countries? Absolutely not. It's just showing that the majority of people that care about their monetary sovereignty reside in a specific set of countries. Or perhaps people just don't want, um, you know, maybe there's a lot of hobbyists in those particular places. Maybe there's a lot of people that really value being sovereign and not being told what to do in those particular countries. Well, that's fine. Overall, I would love to see the number of nodes grow across the globe. But am I worried about it being uh, centralized in a specific spot? Absolutely not, because it has no bearing on me whatsoever. All that should matter to me in regards to nodes are that I get to run mine. So um, I should also uh, note the interesting thing here. Now, it shows number of nodes, but I think the more interesting uh, measurement here would be per capita. How many people out of the total population are running it? Um, and so uh, Singapore and Netherlands here are in the top 20, but these two countries, they're, they're pretty small, right? However, they have the largest Bit number of Bitcoin nodes per capita, 17,000 people, uh, roughly 17, well, around 18,000 people per node, uh, and 32,000 people per node, respectively. When you look at the US, though it has the largest number of nodes per capita, it's 120,000 people per node in the US. So, interesting data nonetheless, um, but worrying. Absolutely not, other than the fact that I'd love to see that number continue to rise, and hopefully it will with plug-and-play models like the one behind me, the CASA note. Uh, finally, uh, last story I want to touch on, and this one is a little bit worrying. If you own a Ledger Nano S, you may need to take a little bit of action on this. There has been a flaw found in the firmware or the software for the Ledger Nano S. Um, now this is, uh, I've got to say, this is scary. And so I've got to do some explaining here. Essentially, what this does, it, it's, not, um, it's not particularly anything that could happen if you're running the actual Ledger software on your computer with your own device. But if you accidentally download malicious software, something you thought was from Ledger, uh, but was not, there is an attack that can happen that can siphon off your money. And let me explain how it works. First, we need to take a look at how a Bitcoin transaction actually works. And you need to think of it this way. Every time you receive a Bitcoin transaction, you can think of it like you're receiving a specific bill. Um, maybe five people give me a $20 bill. So I now have five $20 bills in my wallet. Your Bitcoin wallet actually acts the same way. Even though you can see a total amount, the Bitcoin that you have received still stays in those chunks that you've received it in. So in the instance of my example, $20 a pop, if it was Bitcoin, maybe whatever the value might be, 0.2 Bitcoin, and they stay in those pieces, those little chunks that you've received until you go to spend. Now, much like spending the cash from my wallet, Bitcoin works the same way. So let's use the wallet analogy more. Let's say I want to buy something for $25. Well, I've got five $20 bills in my wallet, but I'm not going to pull them all out. I'm just going to pull out two so I can pay for my item and get my change. Well, in the case of Bitcoin, maybe I'm buying something for 0.25 Bitcoin. Well, I'm going to pull out two of those previous chunks of Bitcoin that I got, and I'm going to give that to whoever I'm paying, and I'm going to receive change, and that's going to go into a change address that has been created. So a new address, much like when you receive regular Bitcoin payments, a new address is created every single time. Well, here's how this bug works. If you've downloaded software that is not from Ledger and is malicious, what it can do is say, I want you to pull out all of the 20s from your wallet, everything that's in your wallet. And when you go to pay somebody, sure, we're going to let all of the, the money that you've designated go to the address that you've set. But 
What happens with the change? We've taken all of the money out of your wallet, and let's say you paid $25 for something, there's $75 left over. Um, in a regular instance, like the first example, I would have pulled out two 20s and gotten $15 back. But this one, they purposely pull out all of the money. So I've got $75 and change left. Well, this software, instead of allowing it to go back to a change address for you, it creates a new change address that belongs to the hacker and the $75 or 0.75 Bitcoin would go to them, which is terrifying. So sorry for the long explanation, but I needed to kind of map it out there for you. Hopefully you got that. Anyways, if you didn't get it, it's still bad. You need to update. There is an update for Ledger. Now, there was a press release from Ledger, which I would say is greatly glazed over. Um, they do talk about the update and they do thank uh, the person responsible for uh, disclosing the, the bug responsibly to them. But it obviously, they don't want it to be like, oh my God, something terrible has happened. Fix it now. Uh, but they do encourage you to update right away. Um, <laughs> Anyways, there's also a full description of how to do that and a, a, a video here. Before you do update your device though, please make sure you have your backup phrase written down somewhere safe so that if anything happens to your device, um, it's, it's still safe and you can still access your funds down the road. I will have links to all of this down below as well as the two other stories I spoke about. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to stop it there. Again, thank you for watching this late. I had my little one up all day and I just didn't have a chance to make this video until now. It's like 10 after 8 and I'm just finishing recording. I still got to edit, upload, thumbnail, all that stuff. So you'll see it at some point tonight. Um, and before you go, please do check out my website. Do head over to Teespring. And if you're in Edmonton, I really hope to see you guys there. Tuesday and Thursday, BitcoinRodeo.com. Grab yourself some tickets uh, and I will leave it there. Thank you guys so much. Have a great night and I will see you tomorrow. I'm doing a Saturday video about hashtag delete Coinbase and why people are doing it. So I'll see you guys tomorrow for your daily session.